So welcome everybody to Financial Wellness and Empowerment Workshop. Um, so I, I know people are uh, from Singapore, uh, rainy Singapore. Um, so for those of you who are not based in Singapore, it's very rainy at the moment. Um, and also we have audience from, I know from Philippines, Australia, Indonesia, Malaysia as well. So welcome everybody. Um, so some housekeeping rules. This session is being recorded and we'll send you all a replay later. So uh, please make sure you remain muted the entire time and your camera is off. Um, so the spotlight will be on the speaker. And also we're going to have a very interactive workshop today, which is very different from all of our webinars uh, from before. So please ask Betja any questions on the chat box anytime during the entire workshop. So um, hello everybody. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Sabrina Ho. I'm the founder and CEO of Half the Sky, um, a career platform for diverse talent. So today is my great pleasure to have Betja to run this financial empowerment workshop for us. So a quick introduction. So Betja is currently a partner at St. James Place Wealth Management in Singapore, and she has over 22 years of international banking and financial services experience. She was also the ex-CFO for Commonwealth Bank of Australia and holding global positions in Sydney, New York, Tokyo, and Hong Kong. And Betra is also a full-time working mother to three kids, and she's passionate about empowering and educating women on financial well-being. So welcome, Betra. We're very lucky to have you today. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, I'm very privileged to be here. <laughs> Thank you. So a figure shows nine out of 10 women will be the sole decision maker in their household on their finances at some point in their life, either due to the death of the spouse, divorce, or because they stay single over the course of their career. So it's important for us to equip, equip with the knowledge and confidence to take control of our finances now and in the future. So in the following 40 minutes, Betcha will share four critical steps to become financially independent, tips on how to make important financial decisions, and how successful planning can assist in bringing the future into the present so we can all start doing something now. And we've also sent out some handouts this morning, and Betcha will walk us through them. Um, so the pre presentation will be followed by a five minutes Q&A session. Since we have a very short Q&A at the end, if you have any questions, please put your questions on the chat box anytime during the workshop and Betcha will answer them for you. So Betcha, I will give the floor to you and I will make you a host now. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. Okay, so... Let's um, All right, now you're the host. <laughs> okay, so let's share my screen. Okay. Awesome. You can all see. Perfect. I can see. Okay. It. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Uh, and, and again, welcome everyone. I'm very, I'm very privileged to be here today. And as Sabrina said, we're going to be talking about financial wellness and empowerment. And, and what is empowerment? The definition of empowerment is compelling. It's the process of becoming stronger and more confident, especially in controlling with one life and claiming one's rights. So ladies, I thought we'll start off with and look at some statistics. It's 2020. And women have come a long way, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done when it comes to women, money, and finances. Do you know um, that 72% of women don't feel confident about selecting investments on their own? Now, this is from Global BlackRock Investor Pulse Survey done in 2018. Do you know that 67% of women feel misunderstood by their financial advisor? And 63% of women feel they don't have enough knowledge so that they can plan for their retirement. These are very, very high statistics. 
60% of women worry they don't have enough money to last them through their retirement. And only 12%, a small 12% of women feel confident that they can retire comfortably. 57% of women feel that financial terminology is confusing and it makes it more difficult to make decisions. Let, let's now look at trends in men and women. 55% of men describe themselves as in control for their financial future versus only a 38% of women. And like I said, even though it's 2020, women are still earning on average 23% less than men. And women on average outlive men by five years. So we have to work harder. Not only are we earning less, but we're living longer. So we need to make our money work so much harder for us. As Sabrina said, nine in 10 women are expected to be the sole financial decision maker at some point in their lives. And believe you me, at that point in their lives, you don't want to be making financial decisions or learning about your finances. That's why it's so important that you are in control and understand your financial position at every point in your life. And do you know that financial concerns are among the most common source of disagreements for couples? Yes, it's not all bad news. And there is good news. 62% of women say they would like more knowledge so that they can make smarter financial decisions. And I'm sure it goes for all of you on the call today. And women are better savers. Women on average save 8.3% of their salaries versus men that only save on average 7.9%. So my job um, as a partner at St. James's Place Wealth Management is to work with women, men, families, business owners to help them become more financially successful, financially confident, and financially savvy. But I adopt a very holistic approach. And I like to look at the three pillars financial well-being, physical well-being, and mental well-being. So let's, let's talk about financial well-being. What, what is financial well-being? Financial well-being is having control of your finances now, tomorrow, and in the future. Financial well-being is the ability to absorb a financial shock. Financial well-being is understanding your own personal goals and objectives. And we're going to talk about this in, in great detail later. It is so important to understand what's important to you. And finally, financial well-being is the financial freedom to live the life you want to live. Now, let's look, talk about physical well-being. So I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not a physiotherapist. Um, but for me, physical well-being is about protection. Protecting yourself. Protecting your loved ones. So, so important. And I think in today's environment with COVID-19, People realize how important this is. And we are going to touch on protection a little later today. And finally, the third pillar is mental well being. I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist um, or yoga teacher, um, but for me, mental well being is about reducing financial stress, it's about providing that total peace of mind. 
and having an understanding and trust in your current and future financial plan. Do you know that a whooping 92% of working Singaporeans report feeling stressed? 92%. And this is way higher than the global average of 84%. And financial stress is the number one cause. Rich or poor, it seems that financial anxiety is part of modern life. Now, these numbers were taken from the 2019 Cigna 360 Wellbeing Survey. And I would, I actually wouldn't want to see what those statistics are based in the current environment. I have no doubt they would be quite higher. So, let's start off and address the elephant in the room. For me, I, I like to address the power of the mind. And, and what are some of the reasons for not starting a financial plan? What are some of the reasons that people don't understand their finances or seek financial advice? So, let's talk about them now. Living in the now. Most people live in the now. They don't like to think about the future. Um, and now, yes, living in the now is important, but we do have to think about the future. And we're going to talk about it a little later when we talk about retirement. Some people are just not ready. Do you know that the number one New Year's resolution every year is to lose weight. I can't help you with that. The number two New Year's resolution is to get on top of your, their finances. But people, people are just not ready. They don't want to move out of their comfort zone. They know what they need to do, but they prefer to stay where they are. People always have excuses conflicting priorities. I'm too busy, I'm busy traveling, I'm busy with work. It's always going to be excuses. But we need to think about what are really are our priorities. Denial, just like people avoid going to the dentist, they avoid going to see a financial advisor or looking at their finances. It's easier to forget about it, push it aside. Cut. Yeah, a lot of people say, oh, I need millions of dollars to invest or to become financially successful. No, not at all. Do you know you can start with even a $1,000 a month, putting away some of your surplus money? A $1,000 a month with the beauty of compound interest can grow quite significantly over a period of time. Pride. People are pride. They don't like to admit they've made mistakes with money. They don't like to admit that they don't know anything or they don't know what to do. Too technical. People think investment and finance is way too technical. I don't understand. That's why I encourage people to seek out someone who can help you. People don't know where to start, who to speak to, trying to find someone to trust. These are all some reasons that people put off looking after their finances. But today, you don't need to have all the answers to start. You just have to be willing to take the first step. An investment in knowledge pay the best interest. So thank you ladies for dialing up and investing in your knowledge to learn. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some financial planning principles. What is financial planning? Financial planning is about 
setting, planning, achieving, and reviewing your life ambition. And, and it's very important that I express it's your life ambition. It's not your neighbor, it's not your best friend or your mother or that person you follow on Instagram. No, that's, that's not important. Today, I encourage you all to look within. Think about what's important to you or to your family to understand your values and your own personal goals and objectives. And we're going to go through this in a little bit more detail shortly. Do you know that a goal-based approach increases your wealth by more than 15%. So, let's start right now. So we're gonna cover up four steps. Number one, we're gonna determine your goals, objectives and needs. Then we're gonna perform a financial stock take. And normally when I say financial stock take, people panic a little bit, okay? It's not gonna be boring, I promise you. I'm going to go to a very high level of what are the key things you need to look at with your finances. We're then going to jump into step three and we're going to help develop a plan. And then we're going to talk about how important it is to implement an ongoing review. Why ongoing review? Because your life does not stand still. Your life it's full of uncertainty, full of changes. And this is something that should be reviewed on an ongoing basis. So, let's all look at the first step, goal setting. So hopefully you've all got some pen and paper. If you don't have a handout, um, just grab some pen, grab some paper. And I just, I'm gonna give you one minute, just to, Jot down, this is, this, this is for you, it's not for me. Jot down some of your goals and your objectives. And I want you to break it into three. Short term, medium term, and long term. So what, what is short term? Short term is between zero and two years. Okay, so what do you, maybe you want to plan a holiday hopefully when they open um, the borders. Uh, it may be you want to buy out property. Okay. Um, medium term is in two to six years. Do you um, want to buy a property? Do you want to plan for education? Do you want to change jobs? Do you want to have a child? Um, and then long term is more six years plus. This is more education planning for your family could be retirement planning, um, it could be buying another property or your first property. But it's very important that we understand what short term, because that's about liquidity, medium term, and then finally long term. So I'm gonna give you all one minute, and you can just write down your own personal goals in the short term, medium term, and long term. And then we're gonna go into the next step. Okay, let's, let's move on to the next step. All right. I think someone's not on mute. Oh, so this is from another election part. Sorry, can you, can you, you move know your... this guy, David Marshall? He was part of the Workers' Party. 
Yes. Oh, okay. It says here in the hammer. Sorry. The whole hammer logo. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, if you can mute um, and then we can use the chat box, if that's okay. Okay, so let's let's go on to the next step. Okay, um, Evelyn, if you can say mute your, um, we can hear you. So let's just go on to the next step. Um, okay, let's go. Let's look at we're gonna the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna perform a financial stock take. Okay, so we've done the goal one. Let's look at goal two. What we're gonna look at is performing a profit and loss. And a balance sheet. Now we're not going to go into the accounting details of that. We're going to go very high level. What what is a profit and loss? A profit and loss is looking at your income, less your expenses, and then we look at your surplus. Now this is quite difficult to do over a 12 month period. So what what I encourage you to do is to look at it on a monthly basis. Okay, it's much easier to think about around, this is my monthly income, less my monthly expenses, right? It's much easier to do that. You would then take your annual expenses um, and you would then divide that by 12. Um, so a profit and loss is looking at expense, your income, less your expenses over a period of time. And that will give you your surplus. Now it's very important to understand your financial situation now so that you can plan for the future, okay? And I'm gonna go over a little bit later why we need to understand what our expenses are on a monthly basis. This is going to help us determine what our emergency fund is, okay? This template does not take too long. And a lot of people say to me, oh gosh, you know, you, you may know your rent and your school fees and your, your utility bill, but you know, when it comes to the other expenses, just do even a rough estimate is good enough. Doesn't have to be to the dollar. It just could even be a rough estimate so you know the basic foundation of where to start. A balance sheet, is at a point in time, okay? So what we look at is your assets. These are things that you own. Less your liabilities are the things that you owe to people. So if I was to ask you to do your balance sheet today, this would be the value of your bank account as today on the 9th of July. It would be the value of your property as at the 9th of July less any of your debt, money that you owe people, as that today's point. A balance sheet is very important because it helps determine what you have as liquidity. What do you have in the bank that you can readily access? And again, this comes down to what I call an emergency fund, which is very important, especially in today's time which we're gonna cover off very, very shortly. So, what we're gonna talk about, we're gonna develop a plan. And we're gonna talk about our savings. And I was talking about emergency funds. So, let's talk about what is an emergency fund. All right. Holding cash in the bank is no longer a very safe, or not, not Safe, it's not necessarily the best option. Why? Two reasons. Interest rates. Interest rates are at an all-time low, and they're certainly not going up. And inflation. Okay. However, we do need to keep cash, liquid assets, in case of an emergency, in case something goes wrong. Now, how much should you keep in the bank? So the right amount to keep in the bank is a rough rule of thumb. Now, this would change depending on individual circumstances. 
but a rough, rough rule of thumb is if you go back up to your expenses, okay, you look at your expenses and you take four to six months of your total expenses, that is what you should have as cash as an emergency fund. Uh, let, let me give you an example. Say I spend $10,000 a month. All right, my expenses are $10,000 a month. I should hold as cash in the bank between forty dollars to $60,000. If I was single and didn't have any children, maybe $40,000 would be okay. If um, I've got kids, and I would hold a little bit more. And in today's environment, with uncertainty of job losses and volatility, and, and no one knows what's happening, I tell my clients, hold just a little bit more, just to help you sleep better at night. Okay? But anything in excess of that is not going to work for you. Why? Like I said, interest rates are low. And second, inflation. So what, what is inflation? Never overlook the impact that inflation can have on the spending power of your money. Do you know that the effect of inflation can be just as severe a risk as a sharp fall in the market? However, market falls are always followed by recovery. You know, markets go up and down, but they, they always pick up again. Whereas inflation permanently, permanently reduces the value of your savings. Okay, we have a question before I continue. How much should we have more for the emergency fund, especially during or post-COVID? Excellent question. Now, this would really, really depend on personal circumstances. And it's like I said, if you were single, okay, um, you would probably have two months more. If you had a family, um, you would have to look at your personal family circumstances. Is your partner working? Do they have an emergency fund? But for me, for an average person, I would say eight months, eight to nine months would be sufficient. That would mean enough if you want to look for a new job or you, you, know, you have to liquidate some of your other assets. Um, but it is a personal, um, personal thing, and it may vary from individual to individual. But generally, no more. And nine months should be sufficient. So let, let me just talk a little bit more about inflation. And I'll give you an example. Because a lot of people say to me, I don't think inflation is real. So let, let's look at it. If you had $1 million in the bank account, okay? and you left it there for 10 years, and you did absolutely nothing with it. Do you know that money? Look, let's look at 3% inflation, because that's the inflation rate for Singapore. So if you left a million dollars in the bank account with a 3% inflation, after 10 years, that amount would drop to $743,000. And if you left it there for 20 years, It'll drop to 552,000. These are real numbers, ladies. The, the right column is inflation, um, 5%, which is more emerging markets. Um, but let's look at 3% for Singapore and, and understand that this is a risk. Okay, let's go back to investments. Let, let's talk about investments. And, and do you have investments? Are your investments aligned with your goals and your objectives? I'm going to ask a question. You can all write in the chat. Who in the room, oh, sorry, who on the screen, <laughs> um, thinks that investments are emotional? And who thinks investments are logical? Come on, if you can write in the chat, if you think investments are emotional, write emotional. If you think investments are logical, 
right logical so someone says half half logical it's a mix very good what else do we have a bit of both anyone else come on ladies tap in what do you think logical emotional half half very good okay so let's have a look here investments are actually emotional yep they're emotional but they should be logical and that's why it's so important to put together a financial plan when you actually have clarity when you actually understand and you have time to sit and think through in a very logical manner and tie them to your values tie them to your goals let's look at this interesting um chart over here think about it when the markets are going up people are excited they're happy they're just thrilled the minute that markets start to drop people get anxious there's a denial there's fear there's desperation there's panic and the minute they start to increase there's a bit of hope there's a bit of relief there's a bit of optimism but let me tell you something ladies Investments are pretty boring, okay, and I'm sure you know that, but investment should be long term. It should be there to give you actual peace of mind, and you should actually remove all the emotion when it comes to investment. So we're not going to talk too much about investment, but I'm going to share with you today some of my five rules that all investors should follow. Number one invest for the longer term okay anything that's short term is going to be too high risk i like to think of investments as 10 years plus now a lot of people say 10 years that, that's crazy so therefore your medium and long-term goals should look at investments all right if you want to buy a property no you wouldn't put that into investment too volatile all right rule number two we've spoken about this make sure you always have sufficient money and deposit to meet your short-term needs this is your emergency fund plus anything extra you may need rule number three don't overlook the impact of inflation this is what we discussed earlier rule number four Diversify your investments as widely as you can. And rule number five, understand your personal goals and objectives. So now we have a question and, and, and I'm gonna bring it back to rule number five. The question is, how can we stay level headed during panic sell or buy in the market? Fantastic question, all right? And this question looks at rule number five understand your personal financial goals and objectives so if you are investing okay you should always be investing to achieve one of your goals all right it would be either retirement planning or education planning or planning for the future and no matter how the market goes up or goes down if you are focused on your goals there should be no change, okay? And this is what I went back to before. If you're short term, you would not invest. It's too risky. Investment should be medium to long term. So the perfect investor is when the market drops, they don't watch the market. They close their eyes. They stick to what their goals are. And the market, the market always picks up. Unlike inflation, inflation is always going up, markets drop and decrease. We have another question. For people who are in their 30s and 40s, would a long term investment plan still be valid? Absolutely. Okay, and I'll tell you, I'm, I'm 44. Okay. And I plan to work, I plan to work forever. Um, but Realistically, I plan to retire around the age of 64, 65. So I've still got 20 years to save. 
up for my retirement. That, that's a long-term investment. And do you know that if you invest wisely, you can double your money every 10 years? So, yes, in your 30s and 40s, perfect time to start saving. What I, when I have problems, when I have people who are in their 60s and they come to me and they say, oh, I want to retire in two or three years' time, then it's, it's much, much harder work. Okay, so in your 30s and 40s, you're in the prime of your life. So when it goes back to investment, it's very important. Let's look at your objectives. Make sure your investments are tied with your objectives. Make sure you understand your investment. Um, make sure, ah, thoughts on cryptocurrency. Very good. Cryptocurrency, very interesting one. Okay, I, I need to add another rule to investments. Never invest in something you don't understand. Okay. Um, cryptocurrency is high risk. And as an investor, you need to understand what your risk profile is. Okay, are you conservative? Are you balanced? Or you're adventurous? All right? And always understand what you're doing. And I'll give you a perfect example. I had someone who came to see me um, at the end of last year. And he walked into my office and he sat down and said to me, Hi, Bakya. I am a very conservative investor. And I said, Okay, great. And I said, so what do you do? And he goes, I work at Facebook. I said, oh, great, great company. And he said, I get my salary from Facebook. I got stock options from Facebook. And I invest in Facebook. And I turned around and I said, and you're a low-risk investor? Mm -mm. He was not a low-risk investor. He was very high risk. He had all his eggs in one basket. He was dependent on Facebook. So... Cryptocurrency may work or may not work for you. It depends on your risk profile, and you do need to understand it. Cryptocurrency, however, is not regulated. Okay, and I will not give my personal opinion on you know that, but just be aware it is not a regulated form of investment. Okay, let's look at number three. Let's look at property. Um, very important is property part of your goals, is part of your vision. All right. If you do have property, do you have a mortgage? Are you getting the best possible mortgage interest rate? Okay. Does your rental income cover your mortgage or are you living in it? Can you use your CPF to pay for your mortgage? Is your mortgage tax efficient? Very, very important question to understand regarding your property. The next one is retirement. Now, retirement is my absolute favorite topic. Why? Because most people live in the now, and they don't think about the future. And generally, when I give workshops, I ask people, who has planned for their holiday? And most people, not, not in COVID situation, but in normal situations, but everyone puts up their hands. Everyone plans for the next holiday. And then I ask, who has planned for their retirement? And people look at me like I'm crazy. But do you know that your retirement is your 20 or 30 year holiday? So you're telling me that you spend more time planning your one or two week holiday than your 20 or 30 year holiday? Hmm. Doesn't make sense. Retirement planning is so important. Because ladies, I'm sure all of you work so hard now. But at some point in your life, when you want to stop working, I'm sure you want to maintain your current lifestyle. So what you need to do is plan to create a retirement pool to live on. Is your CPF fund sufficient? And if you're an expat, do you have a retirement plan? If you're from the UK, you may have a pension, but that's stuck in the UK. Or if you're an Australian, you may have an, a superannuation. Okay, unfortunately, today people's retirement plans or CPS or pension parts are not sufficient for future retirement planning. 
So some questions to ask and think about. What age do you want to retire? Where do you want to live when you retire? What kind of lifestyle do you want to live? And, and, and why is it important? Because if you want to retire and live in Singapore or retire and live in Thailand, your cost of living will be very different. Okay. So very important question to think of. Um, we have a question. What if you had bad experiences investing in bond or equities? Can we avoid these investments? Now, it depends. That's a very good question. Thank you. Um, it depends um, on what your objectives were and depends on what you've determined as a bad experience. Okay, so for me, it's very important to understand why it was a bad experience and to make sure that you don't repeat the same mistakes. And believe you me, as an investment professional, I've made many bad mistakes. But that doesn't mean that I have to avoid it completely. I just need to understand that I'm investing in terms of what my risk profile is and following the investment rules. So the first thing that I'll say is make sure you have a very well diversified portfolio. And going back to Lynn's question, bonds and equities actually move in the opposite direction. So if you would have had a very well diversified portfolio, your investments wouldn't be all moving in the same direction. So you would minimize the losses. So it's all about designing a good portfolio that is well diversified, is aligned with your risk profile, and aligned with your goals and objectives. Okay, let's look at debt management. All right, because these are what we owe people. My general rule of thumb is always try to reduce your debt, except when in a low interest rate environment. And why is that important? It's because we need to look at what we call the opportunity cost. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you an example. If you have a mortgage and you're paying 2%, Okay, 2% interest rate on your mortgage. Would it be better to pay off your mortgage? Or would it be better to invest that money and get a 7 or 8% return? The opportunity cost would be between 5 to 6%. I'll leave it to you to decide. Protection. Okay, let's, let's look at protection. What, what is protection? Protection is insurance. Okay, and for me, I have very um, strong views uh, that insurance and investment should be two separate things. Why? Okay, I'll tell you why. Protection is about protecting your health, protecting your loved ones, protecting your children, protecting your family. Okay. And you would have a certain dollar amount that you would want to protect in terms of your lifestyle. Whereas investment, you want to maximize the opportunity, maximize the return that you can get. So for me, why combine the two? When it comes to protection, it's very, very important to understand what protection you have. Do you have enough? Do you have too much? And what I find a lot in Singapore is that people have too much protection or, or not the right cover, that you're paying money, a lot of premiums, and you don't actually have the right coverage, the right product. It, I really encourage you ladies, if you do have insurance, make sure you understand what you have. Make sure you have sufficient. Make sure your premiums are the best, most cost-effective premiums. And if you don't, talk to someone. Get someone to help you with that. It's very, very important. Family support, education, planning. Are those part of your goals? Do you want your children to go to university? Are you supporting any of your elderly family members? These are important things to plan for. You know, if you're, if you're Singaporean and, and your, your children go to Singapore and, um, university in Singapore, that's great. 
If they go to the US, we could look up about half a million dollars. Have you planned for that? And estate planning is looking after your, your future. Do you have a will in place? Do you have a trust? Do you need that? Um, what will happen in the event of death? How will your money be divided? Not the most exciting thing to think about, but very important, especially if you have a family. So instead of saying I don't have time, try saying it's not a priority and see how that feels. I love this quote. If not now, when? Okay. Um, COVID-19 has brought about a lot of challenges, a lot of uncertainty for people. But for me, it's actually been a little bit empowering because I've had time to sit back and reflect and look at my values and think about what's important. And there's no better time than the present to really start planning and thinking about the future. If you not, won't do it now, when, when will you do it? And finally, in the words of Warren Buffett, if you don't find a way to make money while you sleep, you will work until you die. So thank you, ladies. Um, very much. Um, what I'm going to be doing is opening up the floor for more questions. Um, what you see in front of you, you can all grab your phones. Um, there is a, a QR code. Um, and this is just to get feedback. Um, I host lots of workshops. I host talks. Um, I give consultations. Um, I don't charge for that. Um, and it would be very much appreciated. You can get some feedback on what you thought about of today's webinar. And if you want to attend future talks or you have any comments. So um, if you pick up your phones, um, flash the QR code, that would be great. Um, and now to answer more questions. Um, I know you used to be a CFO at a global bank, highly respected job. Um, why did I want to be a financial advisor? Oh, I love that question. I can speak hours on that. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I was a, fan, a CFO um, and I chose to leave my banking career um, because I wanted to stay in Singapore and I was supposed to be relocated back to Hong Kong. And I knew when I took time off work, I was reevaluating my values and what was important to me. And, and I knew two things. I knew that I was very good at making money for the bank. And I knew I was very good at helping the bank save money. But I was tired of working for a bank and I was looking for a sense of purpose. And I wanted to see how I could go and help individuals, help families, help businesses. And for me, um, I love my job. I have a great sense of purpose by knowing that I can help and make a difference in people's lives. And for me, you know, when you love what you do, everything else kind of doesn't matter. Everything will kind of fall into place. Um, and another reason is I, I saw there was a big opportunity to work with empowering and educating women, something that I'm very, very passionate about. So yes, I'm very passionate and have a lot of purpose with what I do at work. So thank you for the question. Ladies, please, please don't be shy. We still have a um, few more minutes. Let's have some more questions. Any, any more questions? If, if anyone is, is too shy to ask, or, or you after the webinar, you think of more questions, um, my email's there. Please feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to take it offline. Over to you, Sabrina. Thank you so much, Betcha. And yes, you're right. I know how passionate you are to, you know, empowering us because we all know, um, you know, 
we actually live longer. And I think I personally am not very well versed as well in terms of investment. So there's so much that I actually need to need to learn. And I'll definitely give you a call separately after this session. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm I'm very lucky because me and Betcha were just one WhatsApp away. But I'm sure you you all can reach out to her and ask her anything. Um, and she's always so genuine and so generous about the advice that she gives. Yes, so thank you everyone so much for joining us today. And we have a lot of resources to share with you on our platform. So make sure you sign up on halfthiskyasia.com. It's completely free. And you also receive exclusive event invites like this one, job alerts, thought leadership content and resources. Again, it's completely free. And we also actually have several more webinars coming up in July. We have a Women in Leadership Asia conference next week where I'm going to speak on how to be a bold, brave, and game-changing leader together with the MD at SMP Global Ratings, uh, CEOs of Publicist Communications and VMLY and R Asia. And we also have a webinar on how to raise your profiles at work. And end of July, we are partnering with Women in Argue Business for a 30-minute coffee chat, where I'm going to talk about automation, innovation, and technology. How do we stay ahead of the curve? So make sure you check them out on our event page and sign up. So thank you very much, Betcha, for your time today. And stay safe, everybody, and take care. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Sabrina. <laughs>